very important. It's very important in this life. Well, to help guide you through the day's events, I'll be joined by an expert team of ITV presenters. ITN's royal correspondent, Nicholas Owen, will be reporting from the magnificent vantage point of the castle walls overlooking the chapel. John Suchet will be our commentator for the arrivals and for the service, and he'll have the help of the royal expert, Hugo Vickers. Katie Derham is outside the castle, among the crowds, well-placed to bring us and to convey to you the excitement of this big day. And with me throughout the afternoon here in the studio will be the royal author and historian Robert Lacey. So, let's go first, though, to Nicholas Owen on the castle walls. Nick, it must be quite a scene there now. Indeed it is. I'm high up on those walls. Down below me, you can see uh, guests arriving, uh, those coaches, that they're bringing the people who are heading for the chapel. And all these hundreds of other people, they're people who applied for tickets to be allowed within the castle precincts. And they'll have an absolutely grandstand view of arrivals and departures. Edward, arriving on foot with his brothers Charles and Andrew quite soon. After that, Sophie Rhys Jones with her father in a Rolls Royce. And then, when the wedding service is over, the first public view of the newlyweds departing in an open-top Landau carriage. Obviously, open Landau carriage. And that will come out on the roadway behind me, drive up through the castle precincts, everybody getting a wonderful opportunity to wave and cheer them, off up through the castle and out into Windsor Town. Nick Owen on the castle walls. Let's now go to Katie Durham with the crowds outside the castle. Katie, what's the atmosphere out like there? It really is quite something. As you can see, the streets outside Windsor Castle are absolutely heaving. It's thought that about 20,000 people have flocked to the centre of Windsor. Just listen to that. <laughs> here to join in the fun. Some of them have been here since first thing this morning. Many of them have arrived since lunchtime when the atmosphere has really been buzzing. There's been all sorts of fun and games. There have been street entertainers and bands, a roaring trade in Union Jacks, and I gather in pink plastic tiaras. What they're wanting, of course, is to see everybody come into the castle, and they've been cheering everybody and everything from florist vans to the public guests to, of course, some private guests who've decided to walk in. But what they're really waiting for is that first glimpse of Sophie Rhys Jones when she comes past here with her father in the bridal car. As you can see, the castle behind me provides a glorious backdrop to today's wedding. It was Edward and Sophie's own choice, even though no child of the sovereign has been married here for more than a century. With the help of our graphic designers now, we can take a close-up look at the layout of the castle and just how today's events here will unfold. So this is the magnificent structure of Windsor Castle. Its origins date back to the 11th century in William the Conqueror, who built fortifications here to guard London. Since then, it's been altered and extended to become one of the favorite homes of the royal family. The castle is made up of three sections called wards. The upper ward contains the state apartments, open to the public, and the private royal apartments, all now restored to their splendid best after the fire in 1992. The middle wards dominated by the castle's most recognizable landmark, the Round Tower, built as part of the original Norman fortifications. In the lower ward is St. George's Chapel itself, the focal point of today's events. The grass verges here are the vantage point for many of the 8,000 members of the public invited to watch today. So that's the layout of the castle. Now let's take you through what's due to happen this afternoon. In just over half an hour, Prince Edward, accompanied by Prince Charles and Prince Andrew, will begin his short journey to the chapel from the royal apartments. He'll go past the round tower and the crowds in the castle precincts before entering St. George's Chapel through the impressive west door. The bride will arrive after travelling through the town of Windsor. Accompanied by her father, Sophie Rhys Jones will also go past the round tower before entering the chapel at five o'clock. The service will last some three quarters of an hour. Then, after family photographs, the royal couple will leave on a short tour around the packed streets of Windsor. After that, Edward and Sophie will return to the state apartments for the evening's private reception. So, that's the theory. But to see how it's working in practice, let's go to St. George's Chapel now and to our commentator, John Suchet. And uh, in the middle of your picture, the organ screen, which effectively divides the chapel in half. Uh, this side of it, the guests are uh, already arriving, guests of the two families. But on the other side of that organ screen, which uh, we're looking at now, Hugo Vickers, tell us about this. Yes, this is the choir, and on the left-hand side, you can see the garter banner of the Prince of Wales. 
and this intimate chapel is made particularly beautiful by the heraldic achievements of all the knights of the Order of the Garter. And uh, I can tell you it is today festooned with flowers. Uh, I was in there this morning and uh, those flowers have given the chapel the most glorious aroma. And it's in this part of the chapel that uh, the royal family and the royal families of Europe, because they are just family members, will be seated. And if we go outside uh, the chapel, we're looking now at that famous Great West Door. It's here at five o'clock that the bride, Sophie Rhys-Jones, will arrive to be greeted by the Bishop of Norwich. And there is the outside of the chapel and the lower ward, as we saw earlier, full of members of the public. But uh, on only Monday of this week, it was full of... Uh, very different kinds of people, knights of the garter, military knights, household cavalry, military bands, because uh, on Monday of this week it was the annual order of the garter. But today the chapel, uh, the castle precincts have been turned over to ordinary members of the public. And it's uh, ordinary members of the public of Windsor who, as we saw just now, are lining the streets of this uh, town that's had associations with the royal family for 900 years. And in fact, the flags here today aren't because of the wedding. Uh, if you look on the right, that flag on the right, the red, white and green flag is actually the uh, flag of Hungary because the Hungarian president is on a state visit here next week. Actually, the, there is a connection with uh, today's uh, wedding. Mr. Christopher Rhys-Jones, father of the bride, once sold motor tires to Hungary. <laughs> and even further out, beyond Windsor itself, the long walk leading through uh, the great park of Windsor, again lined by members of the public and in about uh, 40 minutes time from now we'll have our first glimpse of the bride Sophie Rhys Jones in a Rolls Royce of the Royal Muse it will emerge from the distance there Royal Lodge in Windsor and come towards us up the long walk towards the castle well we're expecting the first senior members of the royal family to begin arriving in about 20 minutes from now so while we wait, we've got a chance to hear from Prince Edward, who spoke to me earlier this week in an exclusive interview about today's wedding. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. We met in one of the castle's oldest quarters, and I asked Prince Edward if that sense of history was part of the reason for choosing Windsor and St. George's Chapel as the wedding venue. It's a castle that uh, has always been a home uh, and a family home. Uh, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful place, it's got a wonderful atmosphere and a, a tremendous sense of history. It's been here for over 900 years and, uh, and been continuously occupied during all that time. And the chapel itself is just um, a fantastic location. It just seemed to be the, the, the ideal place for having a wedding that was of slightly more family nature. You had to strike this balance between the fact that you are royals, it is a public affair, but you wanted it to have all these elements that you wanted yourselves. Having taken the decision that it was going to be a, a family wedding, that it was going to be at St. George's, it was then trying to, to um, balance that up with, with what was then the huge strength of, of feeling that was coming from the general public. We were able to um, have some 8,000 members of the public come and, and, and actually be a part of it. And, and many of them are local people, which is a very nice touch. Absolutely, yes. I mean, first, priority was to, to local people, but we've also had applications from all over the, uh, the United Kingdom and, and indeed over the Commonwealth as well and beyond. So it, it's extraordinary how, how people want to, to feel, you know, be a part of it. It'll be far more intimate than, than anything that, that's been in before. How did the decision about hats come about? Ladies wearing no hats. Well, basically because we decided to go for a, an afternoon wedding, and that was really on the, on the basis that those are the, of, of the weddings that sort of stuck in our minds, the ones that we enjoyed the most. And, you know, that we thought that that would be a better format of, of going in the, having it in the afternoon and going into an evening of a function. Well, then, of course, you've got the problem, you know, are, you, <laughs> are people going to turn up to wear hats in, in, in church, and then what are they going to wear for the, for the dinner afterwards? It seems a bit strange, everybody sitting around in, in, in hats afterwards. So it just seemed to be simpler just to have the whole affair in, in basically evening wear that, so the ladies didn't have to wear hats and there was never a problem what they're going to have to do with them afterwards. In families up and down the country, one can conjure up these images of these decisions about weddings being made as they sit around the kitchen table and sort of thrashing these matters out. How did it happen in your case? Um, much the same, although it wasn't a kitchen table. <laughs> Dare I ask you, 
what qualities you think you both bring to this relationship? What, what makes it work is, is the fact that we, we both um, you know, get along extremely well. We share a lot of very common interests. Uh, we've, uh, we have had in, in many sort of similar experiences in terms of our sort of business careers as such. And, um, and so we, we, we can uh, help and understand each other and support each other, which is what we've done over the last few years, which is why you know, we, we feel that we'll now be able to take that step and one step further in terms of sharing those responsibilities and, and, and other aspects of, of life. Um, we manage to have a good laugh about things most of the time. And we happen to love each other, which is, which is the most important thing. A great life. sense of humour, very important. It's very important in this life. <laughs> Do royal couples worry about things like the best man's speeches and about misplacing the ring and all that sort of thing? Or, or is that much more highly organised? <laughs> I don't know about highly organised. There's, there's always human fallibility, so we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Um, but um, as, as you know, with, with anything to do with, with, uh, with, with this sort of business, whether it's uh, uh, the theatre or with television or anything else, the things that most people remember most are the things that go wrong. <laughs> I know the feeling very well. <laughs> so who knows? We'll just have to wait and see what happens. And it won't be long before we find out. Let's bring in Robert Lacey now, who's with me in the studio. Robert, he obviously took a great deal of interest and very carefully prepared this wedding. What does this style tell us about the changing face of the royal family? Well, I think it tells us a lot about um, Edward and what he's hoping for and perhaps worrying about. He's the youngest member um, of, of, of the Queen's children. He's very much in the firing line now, really. I think one detects a certain wariness in, in his attitude. Perhaps uh, he took part, after all, in those previous royal weddings, which raised such grand expectations and, uh, and um, uh, uh, were rather disappointing to a lot of people. Um, so I think, you know, choosing Windsor, um, deciding perhaps not to clip-clop through the streets of London was, uh, was, was a wise decision. We've got something here that's family for this family, which is called after this place. And uh, there's a lot of history here. You know, they'll be walking over the bones of King Henry VIII and Charles I. Well, even now in the chapel, we can see some arrivals now. I think uh, we can see Andrew Lloyd Webber arriving there. But this, um, he, he talked about overwhelming public support, Prince Edward. But this wedding hasn't really caught the public imagination as, as others have. No, I think certainly at the time of the engagement, um, the news was greeted with a great deal of cynicism. I mean, I think everybody's rather older and wiser. Um, uh, but um, that incident with the topless photographs, I think, was a real turning point. Um, suddenly people felt sympathy for Sophie. Um, she handled the whole thing with great dignity. The whole palace uh, machinery came round um, behind her. And... Uh, you know, you know, the last time we gathered for a royal occasion was the funeral of Diana, and the, the rather awful memories of that, and uh, the determination that it won't happen again, I think, uh, um, has rallied a lot behind the couple. Very quickly, Robert, what, what about this new title for Edward and Sophie? Well, I think that's one of the things that makes some people shake their heads about the royal family. It sounds very medieval to me. I mean, um, he is a prince, after all. I don't see why he needs, um, and I think a lot of people might agree, doesn't need junior titles. And, uh, you know, for, for most of the world, she's going to be Princess Sophie as well. Robert Lacey, for the time being, thank you very much. Well, as with every wedding, there's bound to be a great deal of preparation for the big day. And in Edward's and Sophie's case, it's been no different. They've been closely involved every step of the way. Katie Derham now takes a look behind the scenes to see what kind of wedding they have planned. It may be a royal occasion, but these are very familiar, even ordinary scenes of last-minute wedding preparations. At the florists in Windsor this morning, the bouquets and the buttonholes. In the kitchens, a big day dawning for a little-known catering company called Rhubarb. They're providing canapes and dinner for over 500 guests. But like any wedding, it's the pictures that will last, and the pressure this morning is building for the official royal photographer, Jane Fincher, whose photos will grace front pages around the world tomorrow. A personal friend of Prince Edward for many years, she's perfectly placed to capture the style of what will be a very different royal wedding. The thing about Prince Edward is he always does it his own style. He's very much his own man, and I think that he... Obviously, the style, you can tell by the style of the photographs he's going to have taken. You know, this time it's, you know, very much more discreet. And I think it probably, hopefully, I hope it will show in the pictures being a little bit more, not intimate, but a little bit more relaxed, you know, a bit more atmosphere to it, other than those sort of standard pictures we've had from the York's wedding and the, the Wales's wedding. The wedding of Charles and Diana is how most people imagine a royal wedding. Pomp, ceremony, 
full military honours and protocol. We won't see that today, but one thing hasn't changed, and that's the fascination with the bride's dress. Sophie's chosen a dress by the unknown designer Samantha Shaw, seen here at her own wedding just a few weeks ago. Despite being a guest that day, Sophie was giving nothing away. Edward and Sophie are a thoroughly modern couple, but they met through a very traditional sport, real tennis. The man who introduced them, now a firm friend, described that first meeting. Sophie was part of the um, PR team and set up the, the day. And um, I think uh, after the 12 hours of playing on, on, on the court, um, I think I took Sophie on court to, to show what it was all about. And then he came and take, took over and um, hit some tennis balls with her. And I think that was really the first time they met. I think they've done very well. I think it's very difficult, um, you know, with a high-profile wedding to sort of um, to play at low click key. But um, you know, it's nice that they've been able to invite all their friends and um, and family. And I think that's what the, 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 you know they, that's what they want, and that's what they've got. And I think that's fantastic. In keeping with tradition, the couple's wedding rings will be made from Welsh gold. That aside, today we'll witness a royal wedding and the party that follows, organised for the first time by the bride and groom themselves. A couple keen to do it their way. And to test public reaction to those wedding plans, we can now go over to Katie Derham. Katie? Well, of course, one of those biggest innovations of today's wedding is the fact it's taking place so late in the afternoon, quite rare for a royal wedding. It's given us all plenty of chance to get excited about it here in the crowds who are now amongst. They've been waiting quite a long time, and they've also come a long way. I know there's two ladies here from Canada. Why are you here? I'm here to see the wedding. I've come all the way from Canada for a visit, and we decided to come out. It was and a good chance. What is it about a royal wedding that made you so keen to come to Windsor? Well, it's something we can't see in Ottawa. There's, there's no such thing as a royal family in Canada, so it was great to see it here. Now, moving along here, what do you think about this new style, a slightly more relaxed style, having an afternoon wedding? I think it's a good idea, really, because um, it gives other people opportunities to come from a long distance and be here in time for it. Do you think that uh, it's been quite good fun, hasn't it, seeing everybody come by an evening dress? Do you think this is going to stick, this new plan? What do you think, madam? I think it'd be a very good idea, actually, because not everybody likes wearing hats, for instance. <laughs> now, it is a fantastic occasion, but quite relaxed compared to other royal weddings. Do you think that we miss the pomp and circumstance and all the ceremony? What, what do you think over here? What do you think? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's, it's great, and it's, it's thousands of people here, so it's great. How long, have you, how long have you been waiting, madam? How long have you been here? From one o'clock. And is the atmosphere good? Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah. Very good. Good atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah, thoroughly enjoying it. Lovely enjoying day. It. As you can see, it doesn't matter that the sun hasn't been shining too much. Everybody here is having a very good time. Katie, thank you very much. One of today's most obvious breaks with tradition can be seen in the guest list for the wedding. To discuss that, I'm joined again by Nicholas Owen. Nick, where have all those invitations gone? Well, Trevor, let's start first in terms of inside the chapel where invitations haven't gone. Rather unusually, surprisingly, perhaps the Prime Minister's not here. Now, he is at a G8 summit discussing Kosovo, but he wasn't invited anyway. Uh, neither was the Duchess of York. Uh, she sent her daughters Beatrice and Eugenie off from their home at Sun Hill, Sunning Hill, dispatched them uh, to the wedding, but she wasn't allowed in herself. And neither was um, uh, Camilla Parker Bowles. You might call her a friend, a part of the family, but she wasn't on the list. Now, who is going to be here? Well, first of all, a very big royal contingent, of course headed by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, the Duke himself flying in by helicopter. He's been at the East of England show. The Queen Mother will be here. Don't forget she's going to be 99 in a couple of months' time. This is something she wouldn't miss. And Princess Margaret is determined to be here as well. And Princes William and Harry, watch out for them. A few foreign royals, not very many, and I count about 30 members of the Rhys Jones family altogether. Then there's a group that you might describe as professional and business friends. People like uh, old Sultan of Brunei, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Tim Rice, David Frost, the motor racing tycoon, Jackie Stewart. And then close friends, well, they include Samantha Shaw, who designed the wedding dress, still a secret, of course, we haven't caught a glimpse of that, and a lady called Ruthie Henschel, actress, dancer, singer, said, alleged, to be an old flame of the prince. She got an invite. One of those fortunate enough to receive an invitation to today's wedding, an old friend of Prince Edward's, Tanya Rose. Now, she allowed us to film her as she prepared for the big day. Well, it's such a smart invitation. The Lord Chamberlain is commanded by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, so I was very pleased to receive it. 
I've known Edward for a very long time, actually. We were at school together at Gordonston. He was great at school. He was good fun, very relaxed. Actually, everybody at Gordonston was very relaxed because there were quite a few famous people and nobody really took any notice of them, which was wonderful. We actually became great friends when I was in a play with him, Hay Fever, and we developed a very, very nice friendship, which has gone on, which is very, very lucky. I love Sophie. She's very good for him. They have a great time. They're very well suited. And she's a very, very nice girl. I'm so excited for them. It's going to be such a happy day. The bit that was a bit scary was the dress, which says, ladies, evening dress, no hats. Suggests three-quarter or full-length dresses, but no ball gowns. So I spoke to Sophie and some other friends, and they said that it was no bearing of shoulders in the church and obviously no um, ball gowns, which are, are very, very big because they take up too much room. So I found a wonderful dress from Bruce Oldfield, and um, hopefully I've got it right. Oh, you look amazing. Is it nice? Fabulous dress. Lovely, isn't it? Yes, really nice. Did you see the split? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, Marvellous. It's good because when It I looks walk. fabulous. The colour suits you so well. Thank you. I think everyone's going to have a good time, and there'll be lots of champagne flowing, so... I don't think anyone's going to get out of their mind. Um, I certainly hope not. I don't think Edward and Sophie have got friends that really will do that anyway. And you're on your way. And we're on our way and we're not late. Hi, darling. I'll meet you at the Barclay in five minutes. I'm on my way. OK, bye. Oh, don't forget to switch off your phone in the church. I know. Have a lovely time. Marvellous. I'm dying to hear all about it. <laughs> See you later. Bye, Tanya. Tanya Rose, one of today's lucky wedding guests. Now, as we move closer to the start of the service, let's see what's going on in the chapel. Let's return now to John Suchet for the ladies. John? And uh, it is a slight shame the sun is not shining this afternoon. It was brilliant all day yesterday for rehearsals, all morning this morning, and it really does, I can assure you, lift the stonework of this great medieval castle. Most of the guests now seated this side of the organ screen, but obviously the royal family, our royal family, and foreign royal families have yet to arrive. These are personal friends of the two families. Who was, uh, we've given you a lot of talk about people, the women not wearing hats. I'll bet you anything you like, there's one lady who'll be wearing a hat today. Has the Queen Mother ever been seen in public without one? Well, we'll find out in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes' time. One interesting aspect of, of this uh, service, the Archbishop of Canterbury there, not officiating today because uh, he has no jurisdiction in this chapel. It is known as a royal peculiar under the jurisdiction of the Dean of Westman, uh, the Dean of Windsor, but he's also yielded today to the Bishop of Norfolk, whom we'll see shortly. He's a personal friend, uh, sorry, the Bishop of Norwich in Norfolk, a personal friend of the couple. Now, one interesting aspect of the service is that Prince Edward has personally made sure that he has had a hand in every single decision. Hugo Vickers, he, he really, he's actually driven them slightly mad with his constant changes of mind, hasn't he? Well, I, I think that because he wasn't going to get married at Westminster Abbey, he was able to have a completely free hand. And uh, the Dean of Windsor, David Connor, and the successor Alan Guile, and those that have been arranging the service, have been able to help him uh, decide on exactly what he wants. So his qualities as a theatrical impresario have come very much to the fore. <laughs> Even, I can assure you, to the extent of uh, choosing the chairs that uh, his parents and the bride's parents will be sitting on, and we'll see more of those in a moment. These are gentlemen ushers. The scene inside the chapel, 560 guests in all. Most of them this side are already seated, as we've uh, heard. Actors, there's Anthony Andrews, the actor. Uh, sportsman Jackie Stewart is here. Andrew Lloyd Webber, whom we've already seen. And uh, shortly, the first of the royal arrivals will begin, and one of the first we'll see will be the Queen Mother, as Nick Owen said, uh, determined to be here today just two months short of her 99th birthday. Now, private uh, guess, I'm actually not sure who that is. Do you know, Hugo? I think that that's um, uh, Tiggy Legberg. <laughs> Thank you for your expertise. And uh, that uh, front part of the chapel, the choir, uh, is where the royal family will be. Now, here's uh, Earl Snowden going in through the Galilee porch he was invited, although he's technically no longer a member of the royal family, divorced from Princess Margaret. Uh, Hugo, Princess Margaret will also be here, as we've heard from Nick Owen. 
Princess Margaret was determined to come today. Um, she's coming to the service, there, possibly not to the reception. Um, she takes a particular interest in St George's Chapel as the one member of the royal family who comes most often to the chapel, in fact. She's very devout. That, that I must say, is a surprise to me. Uh, I think the public perception of Princess Margaret is as a bit of a party-goer. She spends a lot of time in Mustique in the Caribbean. We don't think of her as a church-goer. Well, she's very high Anglican, and actually I think that all hails back to that original decision many years ago not to marry Group Captain Townsend because he was divorced. But um, it's great that she's going to be here this afternoon, and uh, I do know that she was very particularly keen to come here. And uh, we won't see her arriving because I understand she'll be in a wheelchair. Yes, uh, she will travel in a wheelchair which belongs to Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, which is uh, occasionally very, very reluctantly used by the Queen Mother, but not very often. And we're looking at the crowds within the walls. They're wondering who they're going to see first. I wonder if they know that one of the first arrivals will be uh, the Queen Mother herself. <laughs> Not at this particular moment. These are personal friends uh, arriving at the entrance to Horseshoe Cloister. To their right as they go in, they'll see that great west door. And uh, they've been bussed in today. Another sign of the uh, informality of uh, this particular service. Well, there's one lady who didn't obey Sophie Reese jones's instruction and uh, a lady behind her, both in their hats. In fact, looking out of my vantage spot here inside the walls, I can see plenty of women in their hats. I suppose it was inevitable. Quite interesting, Hugo Vickers, you and I were both inside the chapel yesterday when the royal couple were rehearsing, um, and we were both struck by their sense of humour. We heard Prince Edward talk about their shared sense of humour, and uh, I was particularly struck by, even when the, the, the bishop was rehearsing their vows with them, they could barely stop laughing. Yes, I, I thought that was a very good sign, and there was a, a, the bride particularly had a lovely laugh, and it looked as though they were tremendously in rapport with each other. And um, the bishop was, it was a very intimate moment really, because the bishop was explaining to them the uh, different parts of the service, and uh, telling them about the rings, and how they would put those on, and so forth. It was, uh, it was rather wonderful to have seen that. <laughs> and we're looking at the long walk in Great Windsor. The, park, the Great Park of Windsor. That statue in the distance is known as the Copper Horse, surveying the countryside around it. And the reason we're looking at this is that at any moment now, shimmering in the distance, we expect to see the first of the Royal Daimlers, which will have come from Royal Lodge, which is the Queen Mother's residence out here at Windsor, and it will contain the mother of the bride. And we can look now at the road from Royal Lodge. Royal Lodge, I, I should say, is, uh, as I said, uh, the Queen Mother's residence here. Um, she's actually owned it for nearly 70 years. And she gave it last night to the, bride, the bride's family and the bride, Sophie, and her parents, Christopher and Mary, stayed at Royal Lodge last night. There's something of a tradition of the Queen Mother lending her residences for royal weddings. She uh, allowed uh, Diana to stay in Clarence House her London residence before her wedding to Prince Charles at Westminster Abbey. And now more guests arriving by bus at the door leading in to the Horseshoe Cloister with the Great West Door. I must say, we, we really haven't seen scenes like this at Windsor before, guests be, being bussed in. Now, Hugo, we're looking here at some foreign royals. Is that the Sultan of Brunei in the front? Yes, indeed, the Sultan of Brunei, who will actually be sitting in the Queen's stall. That's uh, very rare. Um, he's uh, an honoured guest on this particular occasion, being greeted there by Sir Malcolm Ross from the Lord Chamberlain's office. He, he will sit in the Queen's stall in the chapel? Why, why might that be? Well, um, uh, that is where they've chosen for him to sit. They, uh, very rarely it is, is it ever used other than by the Queen or indeed the Dean of Windsor, who uses it at uh, regular services. Well, his family, through his rather disreputable brother, involved in some scandal here in London recently, but uh, the Sultan, above all that, it's uh, rumoured that uh, he's provided funds for Prince Edward's production company, television production company. Who knows? Being led through the nave of the chapel, he'll be taken under that organ screen and into the front of the choir. And I'm told that we 
can now see the bridal car. Here it comes. Sorry, the bride's mother's car. This is a Daimler of the Royal Muse, and inside it, Mary Rhys Jones. In her 60s, in her mid 60s, she's a former secretary, and uh, she's said in an interview that she took in typing when the children were young so that they could have private schooling which both parents felt was important and i can tell you that in that car with her is uh, her son's her son david's wife uh, mrs david reese jones and other members friends of her family And it's uh, taking the long walk in. We'll see there. There's the castle in the distance. That's a magnificent view. And that car will take them all the way up to the castle through the long walk. Uh, 300 years old, uh, this walk planted almost for the first time, almost 300 years ago. Well, it shouldn't be too long now before we get our first glimpse of the bride. And, of course, the closely guarded secret that is her wedding dress. And with me now is Amanda Wakeley, one of Britain's leading fashion designers. Amanda, any clues at all about what this dress is likely to look like? Well, it's always a closely guarded secret, but I think we can imagine um, or hope that um, uh, the Queen will have probably lent a tiara for Sophie to wear. Um, I've heard a rumour that she's not wearing a veil over her face um, because she's Why claustrophobic. Um, whether it's because she's claustrophobic, whether it's because she wants everyone to see her on the way to the chapel, I don't know. Um, and I would imagine with Samantha Shaw doing the dress, it would be a very simple, very sculptural dress. Is that all? I mean, well, come on, g give us some clues. I mean, what else? How, how will it look? I would think that she'd choose a, a very special fabric, um, probably a heavier fabric, like a silk mercado or an organza. Um, and I would imagine quite grand with a, quite a long train. Well, we'll see whether you arrive. Prince and Princess Michael of Kent are arriving. Let's go back now to John Suchet. Yes, indeed, uh, they are, as we're about to see, <laughs> climbing the steps to the Great West Door. Well, we would have seen them. They did, I assure you, climb just a few moments ago. That's the Duchess of Kent. Now, uh, Hugo Vickers, we are dealing with British royalty here. Oh, now there are the Kents entering the chapel. But family members, first and foremost. Yes, Prince and Princess Michael of Kent arriving had just arrived in a bus, and there is uh, their daughter, Gabriella. A rather an interesting figure, if you can see in the background, in a mauve coat, is Marina Ogilvie, the daughter of Princess Alexandra. This is the first time that she has attended a royal event for many years. And I hope you can hear us uh, over the aeroplane noise. They uh, fly over this castle every two minutes, <laughs> enormously noisy. It's uh, understood the Queen has double glazing in her private apartments. And it passes overhead, and uh, the first members of our royal family arrive walking on that blue carpet that's the deep blue of the order of the garter that the scene can't be too often that we've seen a bus pulled up outside uh, uh, the great west door and the duke of kent arriving by bus <laughs> really quite quite extraordinary scenes to see royalty arriving by bus And everything uh, is happening exactly on schedule here. Informal, though, this event is by Edward's request. Uh, when royalty is concerned, things really do happen exactly on time. Well, so far, anyway. And it was uh, the Duke of Kent's uh, daughter, Lady Helen Windsor, who was married at this chapel in uh, 1992 just seven years ago and I believe that was the last royal wedding in this chapel Hugo Vickers yes and uh, there there is uh, Lady Helen Windsor in the background her husband uh, Tim just coming in Tim uh, who's been unwell yes he was he was quite unwell and it's very good to see him looking very fit and well today and uh, the Princess Royal and her husband Captain Tim Lawrence and is that their children uh, her children behind uh, Hugo there's Zara Phillips and there's Prince Harry. Yes, indeed, with Prince her. Harry. What's interesting is the, the fact that they're all coming uh, very informally. Prince William bringing up the rear. And Prince William, who's, uh, what, birthday in a few days' time, I think? Yes, absolutely. And uh, normally... In 17 the... he'll be, so he becomes an adult, in effect. Ah. Now, here's the groom, our first uh, sighting of the bridegroom on the right there. 
Prince Edward, accompanied by his two brothers. Now, they are acting for him today in the in capacity as best men. They're not called that. They're called supporters. Now, normally, Hugo Vickers, most of us have one best man. Edward has two, and they're not called best men for very special reasons. Well, yes, m m uh, sons of the sovereign have, as you say, two best men known as supporters, and they uh, will be looking after him on this occasion. Prince Edward himself actually served in that capacity for both his brothers at their weddings uh, some years ago. And there was a lot of discussion, I can tell you, in the palace as to whether he should uh, drive down, but he insisted on walking, accompanied by his brothers, even if it sets the schedule backwards. And I'm told that uh, it's very likely that in the car that we can see passing now is the Queen Mother. Yes, it must be there. The boys are bowing to her, her grandchildren. And this is the Queen Mother arriving. She'll be 99 in two months' time. And she'll emerge from that car at the Galilee porch entrance. And I can assure you there will be a deafening roar from the thousands of people. It's already started. They know she's in there. They've recognized her. She was determined to be here. pointless trying to talk of anything else while we're waiting to see the Queen Mother. Lovely the way uh, her three grandsons stood aside to let the car go by, bowing as she went past. Here she comes, in a hat, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Two hip transplants, but she's doing enormously well. And you can perhaps hear the cheers in the background. Well, cheers really for her. And indeed for the groom. There she goes. What's he seen, I wonder? <laughs> well, he wanted informality, Prince Edward, and he's got it. I mean, these really are unprecedented scenes. I, I know these pictures are being seen across the world and certainly viewers across the world will never have seen the British royal family in scenes quite as informal as these. No military uniforms for a start. I don't think there's been a, a, we a wedding of a senior royal without dozens, hundreds of military uniforms and you'll see virtually none today. There will just be a few. I'll tell you more about that in, 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 in a moment. Great scenes these. As another plane passes perilously low overhead, he enters uh, the horseshoe cloister to uh, mount the steps to the Great West Door with his two brothers. And uh, his bride will be arriving in a little over 15 minutes from now. Red carpet being laid at the foot of the steps, especially today. doubt the bishop yes there he is the bishop of norwich chosen especially today to officiate because he's uh, been a friend of the royal couple for several years they've met him often at sandringham and he has instructed them edward and sophie over the last few months and said that they have been taking the vows very seriously the dean of windsor and indeed, that is the Dean of St. George's Chapel, not the Bishop. Am I right here, Hugo? I, I think I got the Bishop and the Dean muddled up. That is actually the Dean of St. George's Chapel, who is greeting them in his official capacity. He will now hand over to the Bishop. And uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, Prince Edward has arrived absolutely on time, because uh, one of the concerns about his wish to walk down the hill was that he might not get there on time. But there we see the Queen Mother coming in uh, with uh, uh, Canon White. And she will take her place in the choir. Um, she's followed, incidentally, by Prince George of Hanover, who's married to one of Prince Edward's aunts.
Prince Edward is now about to reach the North Organ Spring, and he's turning off because he's going to go into the Bray Chantry, where he will have a few minutes of quiet contemplation before the bride arrives. The Bray Chantry, actually, incidentally, rather interestingly, is the chapel bookshop, so he may find a number of things to divert him in these few quiet moments as he waits. And uh, let's give front stage to Mr. Tilehard Scott, who is organ scholar to the College of St. George and who's playing the organ now. And uh, in an extraordinary... Ah, Princess Margaret has arrived. She is in a wheelchair. Um, as Hugo Vickers said, she was absolutely determined to be here, seated alongside uh, the Queen Mother. And Hugo, while we have a moment, uh, I said earlier that uh, Prince Edward arranged every detail uh, of this sir oh well before i get onto that who can avoid prince william 17 in two days time i was going to mention those amazing chairs that we saw but uh, now we're looking at the choir stalls with uh, harry with harry and william with their two cousins princess beatrice and eugenie uh, their mother the duchess of york has not received an invitation to be at this wedding and uh, the word is that she was not too pleased about that but she's not here her daughters are and uh, princess royal captain lawrence zara phillips i think there in fact there'll be two zaras in the audience today at least two zara phillips and indeed uh, the wife of david reese jones is also called zara good day for zaras <laughs> and while we're looking at this part of the chapel the front part to the high altar at the top uh, i can tell you that prince edward has kept one surprise uh, for his bride i'll tell you about that when i've told you about this car which is the second royal muse daimler and it contains four very excited little children two page boys and two bridesmaids uh, they are not royalty they're all commoners children or friends of colleagues and uh, as i said very excited but let me tell you continue telling you about the front of the chapel uh, Prince Edward has held back one surprise for his bride today this morning he ordered the chapel to be filled with sweet peas Sophie's favorite flower and famous of course for its scent and when she emerges through that uh, organ screen he hopes that she will breathe in and be stunned at the uh, sight and scent of all those sweet peas that wonderful top shot there of the castle set the, the uh, chapel set in the grounds of the castle with the town of Windsor beyond Robert Lacey as we see some of those arrivals and uh, the bride's mother is due to arrive in just a few a few seconds now we were talking earlier about this business of the titles conferred on them and what and what you made of them yes um, well, it's been announced that um, uh, Prince Edward will become um, Earl of Wessex. And I think, can we just, just stop you? Here's the Queen arriving with the Duke of Edinburgh. And in fact, that he will, after his father's death, yes. inherit the title of Duke of Edinburgh, which is, is, is definitely a gesture towards um, uh, Prince Philip. But what's interesting is that they, they could well have waited until after the Duke of Edinburgh for, for him to do that. Well, there are some who would say that, but um, uh, this is the sort of thing that the Queen takes very seriously indeed. Well, here's the Queen arriving, and you can hear the chairs from outside now. And, uh, absolutely glorious. And there, there are the flags. Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen waving to the crowds as the car makes its way up towards the St. George's Chapel. Robert, please go on. You're saying the Queen is determined to do things in her own way. Although Edward, of course, wanted something to be very informal, and this, this sort of reinforces the traditional aspect of royalty, isn't it? Yes, it does. And there's also a consideration about um, Sophie, because um, by normal royal etiquette, she, should, she, she can't become Princess Sophie. You can only become Princess Sophie if you're born a princess. So she would have otherwise to be called Princess Edward. Now she will be known as the Countess of Wessex, although, as several people have pointed out, Wessex doesn't exist anymore. I mean, if you choose to be historical, we're going back to the year 1000 and um, King Alfred of Essex, in fact, the only Wessex, um, uh, the only king actually called uh, the great Alfred the Great. Let's go back. 
and the Queen is wearing a hat. <laughs> Whatever next. Never mind, I'm sure her future daughter-in-law will forgive her. She's said to have a special relationship uh, with Edward, her youngest child. Uh, in fact, she'd been on the throne for 12 years when he was born, and uh, there were those that said she was more confident in her role as queen by then and could afford to be a little bit more relaxed and spend a little bit more time with Edward than perhaps she did uh, with uh, her elder children. And uh, it was also said that Edward was more free to go his own way, being the youngest and also further from the throne. And uh, the Dean of St. George's Chapel there, who I misidentified earlier as the Bishop of Norwich, but that's the Dean of Windsor, who is in charge of this church. As I said, even the Archbishop doesn't have uh, jurisdiction over him. And no doubt he's explaining to the Queen exactly what will be occurring. Uh, though this could be a little tactic here, because actually the uh, Queen and Duke have arrived just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. That could be fatal, so I'm sure there's a little bit of uh, delaying tactics occurring here. Oh, I think one could say that's uh, a purple outfit with twin pearls, I can feel confident in saying. <laughs> It's a magnificent sight, the uh, great west door of this uh, imposing, but at the same time, rather intimate chapel. And we're back in Windsor Great Park. And this is, I'm confident, a Rolls Royce, and it contains the bride. We're about to have our first view of Sophie Rhys-Jones in the back of this car. Here she comes. And she's got a veil. With her father, Christopher, alongside her, mid-sixties, retired from the motor trade. And that is our first sight of Sophie as the car takes her along the long walk. And she won't go straight up into the uh, castle where the walk leads. It'll turn left, this Rolls Royce, and it will go through the town of Windsor to be cheered by the people of Windsor. Amanda Wakeley. A veil, there is a veil. There is a veil, I was wrong. In fact, we've um, had a, the release through from the palace now, and um, I can reliably inform yes. you what's, that what's the, dress um, like? the dress is um, long and fitted with a panelled coat over it, with a train, and seems to have an awful lot of glass beads and pearls embroidered onto it. They say 325,000, well, it's going to weigh an awful lot. Well, we'll hear more about it in a, in a little later, I'm sure, but now let's go back to John Sushan as the Queen and the Duke, to the accompaniment of yet another plane overhead, I'm sorry if it's drowning out my voice, walks up the aisle towards the altar screen, uh, the choir screen, I'm sorry, and beyond it into the choir, where the choir boys are now taking their places. And uh, Sophie should reach the church in about eight or nine minutes from now, after her tour of the town, which we will, of course, bring you as it happens. It'll just take a few minutes for her for the Rolls-Royce to travel the length of the long walk as the groom's parents, well, he wants it to be informal, so let's call them the groom's parents, walk up the aisle to take their places. Now, here is Sophie's mother on the left, Mrs. Rhys jones on the arm of her son, David. He's in his late 30s. He works in insurance. Greeted by the Dean And in fact, David, David will be reading a lesson during the service. Those flowers, top of your picture, have been specially put there today. Uh, the whole chapel is festooned with them, roses, lilies. There, shot of the royal family, the queen, the duke, the queen mother, Princess Margaret. Haven't seen them together like that for a long time. Princess Margaret, as we heard, also determined to be here although she's in a wheelchair. And Mrs. Rhys Jones and David enter St. George's Chapel. And the uh, chairs in this part of the chapel are facing in, as you can see, so that their friends get a good look at all the main players 
in this wedding this afternoon. That's not normal. The chairs normally face forward. And those candlesticks were special too. They were brought in. I watched them being put in place yesterday. This is the bridesmaids and pages car. Those four little children who will be bustling around the train of that wedding dress. I'll tell you very quickly their names. Camilla Hatton, Olivia Taylor. Those are the two bridesmaids. And Harry Warburton and Felix Sarbats are the two pages. Their ages range from eight to five. And they've been, I can assure you, rehearsing hard. And through the streets of Windsor towards the chapel. Shortly to be followed by the bridal Rolls Royce. I was saying earlier, this uh, town has had a long association with the royal family. Well, ten centuries, a millennium, because it was William the Conqueror in the 11th century who laid the foundations for Windsor Castle. And uh, Windsor Castle is the oldest battlement, royal battlement in the country. That's the Guild Hall of Windsor on the right. Sir Christopher Wren had a hand in it. And uh, we were here very early this morning, and I can assure you the crowds were, <laughs> they beat us to it. And into the grounds of the castle. And any moment now, we'll be able to pick up the bride's car as it approaches the top of the long walk. But at the moment, we're seeing the page boys and bridesmaids entering the precincts of the castle to the cheers of the crowd. Now, Hugo Vickers, is that the entrance to the Royal Apartments? They're going in the private way. Yes, they're going into the upper ward. And let's go straight back to Windsor Great Park for the bridal car. Look, people running alongside of it to catch a glimpse. Making its stately progress up the long walk. I was saying earlier that uh, this, this walk was first planted uh, 300 years ago. It is, if you like, the Mall in the countryside. And fulfilling the same function today as the Mall normally would. It's the route that the Queen regularly takes when she comes to the castle. And back inside now as uh, those four little children arrive. And we look again at the bride's car. There it is, shimmering in the distance right at the end of our lens. You can just see the bride in the back with her father. He uh, said recently that uh, Prince Edward came to see him between Christmas and New Year to ask his permission to marry uh, his daughter. And he said, I was extremely pleased. We like him immensely. We've known him for some time. Well, Sophie might have said here, here to that. He's a very, very nice chap, said Christopher Reese Jones. He also said it's the only time he's ever needed a gin and tonic before 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and we're about to see those uh, two boys and two girls emerge and be escorted up the steps to perform their duties and now Hugo Vickers uh, we see the groom and his supporters entering the chapel proper. He's, he's actually, I, I must say, just before you saw, we, we were there watching the rehearsal yesterday. I was struck by how tall he is. He's, he's, he's about six foot, isn't he? Yes, perhaps just a little bit under that. He's just now coming out to take up his place in front of the, the organ screen because the first part of this service will take place uh, in the nave so that the guests in the nave feel a part of it. And that's the Bishop of Norwich in his mitre trying to put four little beating hearts at ease, I suspect, without too much success. Quite windy, as you can see. It, it, it is a pity, that, because it's been so hot here. Ah, oh, lovely. Look, 
one of the bridesmaids. Now, which one is that, Hugo? Well, uh, what I'm particularly interested in is the costumes, because they are dressed almost as miniature Knights of the Garter. Rather fun with the little bonnets that the Knights of the Garter wear. And indeed, which we will have seen on Monday this week for that annual ceremony. Back with the bride and her smiling father. And uh, it's nice and calm for them at the moment, but it's going to turn into Windsor Town proper in just a moment or two from now. And I can assure you, uh, the noise of the crowds will drown out what you can probably hear over my voice now. <laughs> Yet another aeroplane. Well, flashing light bar, flashing uh, camera bulbs, that's the sort of thing that uh, Sophie's going to have to get used to from now on. And now into the streets of Windsor. Somewhat appropriate that the uh, Union flag is out today, even if it's uh, not for this occasion. Not a glass coach this time for this royal wedding. It was a glass coach for Diana's wedding, but a Rolls Royce. With a perspex, perspex back, by the way. Uh, the normal uh, steel back has been removed, and it's covered in perspex. There, a perfect view of it, just so that you can see, as we can, the bride. When uh, Christopher Rhys Jones was asked in one interview how he thought Sophie would fit into the royal circle, he said, I think she will do very well. She isn't exactly catapulted in. It has been a fairly long apprenticeship. Now that's the statue of Queen Victoria at the bottom of Castle Hill as the bride's car takes her and her father up into the precincts of the castle. You'll see her, you'll see the car about to go through a set of rather imposing gates at the top of your picture. And in just a few moments from now, she will pass our commentary position. That's right, John, she's due to come by our studio here any minute now, or any second now. And I can really see the flash bobs. Amanda, you have a second chance now to tell us about the dress. Amanda Wakely in the studio. There she is. Well, interestingly enough, she's sitting right forward in the car, so I don't know whether that has anything to do with trying not to crease the dress. Um, but you can actually see that the dress is quite low at the back, too. But it's a classic design, isn't it? Very classic design, yes. So all we hear about the, a very modern wedding, there are elements here of the traditional classic design of the wedding dress. What about the train? Is it going to be as long as the previous ones we've seen, you think? Well, we saw um, shots in the paper this morning of her in a calico mock-up of her, her train, I think, for the rehearsal. So I think she'll, she'll have quite a grand train, but it won't be the metres and metres that we've seen in previous royal weddings. Amanda Wakely, for the time being, thank you very much. Let's go back now to John Sibley. And uh, in a moment, we will see that dress in its full length for the first time. And I should tell you that uh, moments after uh, she steps out of that car, she'll be greeted, first of all, by uh, the Bishop of Norwich. And we will then hear a splendid sound, uh, a fanfare, especially composed for her, called you'll be surprised to hear, Fanfare for Sophie. And it's to be played by trumpeters from the band of the Royal Marines under the direction of Captain J.R. Perkins. And those trumpeters will be in uniform. And those are the only military uniforms that we'll see today. passing now down past the wall of the chapel itself past those uh, 8,000 people who won ballots to be here
turning into Horseshoe Cloister. To stop at the foot of the steps to the Great West Door, there's the Bishop of Norwich waiting to receive her. And the moment uh, that a lot of uh, women listening, watching, will be waiting for, that dress designed by Sam Shaw. We're about to see the full length of it for the first time. Well, <laughs> I can't comment on these things. I'm not an expert, but it looks a pretty fine dress to me. Lovely necklace as well with... Uh, a cross at the end in pearls it looks like I'm told that uh, it's actually a black and white pearl necklace interspersed with white gold rondels and a matching pair of black and white pearl drop earrings you can probably tell I've just been handed that and the dress the veil blowing in the wind it is a little bit nippy out there today and welcomed by the man who will officiate the Bishop of Norwich. He's the Reverend, the Right Reverend Peter Knott, Bishop of Norwich since 1985. <laughs> Lovely shot of safety. Samantha Shaw on the right, the dress designer, having made sure everything is right. And are we about to hear that fanfare? perfectly at the end of that fanfare now playing Marche Heroique Heroic March by Sir Herbert Brewer who died in 1928 as the bride is escorted up the steps by her father this was rehearsed at painstaking length yesterday and it was well worth it they negotiated it perfectly he's carrying her bouquet I think which uh, was prepared by a local florist to mirror the stylish and romantic thoughts of the bride and groom. And he hands it to her now as he escorts her up the nave. And as we said earlier, when she reaches the uh, organ screen, her groom, Prince Edward, will step forward to join the second half of the procession. And the reason is that if he didn't do that, the uh, guests in this part of the church simply wouldn't see them together until the end of the service and so in a major break with tradition we're about to see prince edward step forward to acknowledge his bride but not to take her hand but simply to walk with her into the choir area but before they actually pass through the service will begin at this point as the bishop begins with that well-known introduction to any wedding service dearly beloved we are gathered here and we'll hear that now before they process through to the choir area of St George's dearly beloved we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony which is an honorable estate instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence 
and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee, and is commended in Holy Writ to be honourable among all men, and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand, unadvisedly, lightly or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God, duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind according to the will of God, and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright, that those who are called of God to this holy estate should continue therein in pureness of living. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause, why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. That oh so poignant moment in any wedding ceremony, total silence, and so the first hymn begins, which all schoolboys and girls know, ye holy angels bright, as Prince Edward leads through into the choir section, followed by his bride. Edward. see those flowers now look on the floor lining the choir stalls and also wrapped around all the lamps in the stalls it must smell marvelous in there central part of the service, the wedding vows. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be well assured, 
that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Edward, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live. I will. Sophie, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. Take thee, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Sophie Helen. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold, to have and to hold, from this day forward, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, till death us do part, according to God's holy law, according to God's holy law, and thereto, and thereto. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. I, Sophie Helen. I, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. Take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. Better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto. And thereto. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring, which we hallow in thy name, that he who gives it and she who wears it may abide in thy peace, continue in thy favor, go on and grow old in thy love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. With my body I thee honour. With my body I thee honour. And all my worldly goods. And all my worldly goods. With thee I share. With thee I share. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. And of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman whom we bless in thy name, that living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge 
and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together and live according to thy laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Edward and Sophie have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully with his favor look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life, that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. The vows over Charles Wesley's famous hymn now to love. Sophie's brother David now to read the lesson. A reading from the first letter of John. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But the unloving know nothing of God. For God is love, 
and his love was disclosed to us in this, that he sent his only son into the world to bring us life. The love I speak of is not our love for God, but the love he showed to us in sending his son as the remedy for the defilement of our sins. If God thus loved us, dear friends, we in turn are bound to love one another. The Dean of Windsor now. Let us pray. Taking over at this stage from the Bishop of Norwich. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, save thy servant and thy handmaid. O Lord, send them help from thy holy place. Be unto them a tower of strength. O Lord, hear our prayer. O God of our fathers, bless these thy servants and sow the seed of eternal life in their hearts, that whatsoever in thy holy word they shall profitably learn, they may indeed fulfill the same, that so obeying thy will and always being in safety under thy protection, they may abide in thy love unto their lives' end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O merciful Lord and Heavenly Father, by whose gracious gift mankind is increased, bestow, we beseech thee, upon these two persons the heritage and gift of children, and grant that they may live together so long in godly love and honesty that they may see their children Christianly and virtuously brought up to thy praise and honour through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh God, who has taught us that it should never be lawful to put asunder those whom thou by matrimony hadst made one and has consecrated the state of matrimony to such an excellent mystery that in it is signified and represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church. Look mercifully upon these thy servants that both this man may love his wife according to thy word as Christ did love his spouse the church who gave himself for it loving and cherishing it even as his own flesh. And also that this woman may be loving and amiable and faithful to her husband and in all quietness, sobriety and peace be a follower of holy and godly women. O Lord, bless them both and grant them to inherit thy everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love unto your lives' end. Amen. And now the choir rises to sing the motet, 
Where there is charity and love, there is God. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. The Bishop of Norwich giving a blessing and now the final hymn before the signing of the registers. Let all the world in every corner sing.
And now while the, the choir continues to sing an anthem by Elgar, followed by the Amen Chorus from Messiah, the uh, bride and groom and the two respective sets of parents are behind the altar in an area known as the Northeast Choir, signing the chapel register. And I, I actually had a look at that register yesterday. It's already been filled in. Edward Anthony Richard Louis Mountbatten Windsor, Prince of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Sophie Helen Rhys-Jones, Company Director. Now, while we look at members of the royal family there, uh, and some celebrities, Sir David Frost, uh, Hugo Vickers, why Edward Mountbatten Windsor? Well, very interestingly, in 1960, a declaration was made that the, any members of the royal family that were descendants of Queen and Prince Philip who used surnames should use the name of Mountbatten Windsor. That was put onto the register of Princess Anne and also Prince Andrew. Originally, the um, house was de uh, described as the House of Windsor, but this is a tribute to the Mountbatten ancestry, if such it can so be considered of the Duke of Edinburgh. And Sophie's brother there with his wife, Zara. As the uh, choir will begin the Elgar anthem while the register is signed. Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, that is a necklace. And the Queen Mother, these really are remarkable scenes. We haven't seen such intimate scenes of the royal family for a very long time, certainly never at a royal wedding. Duke of Kent on the right. Duke and Duchess of Kent and Princess Margaret, her really her first major appearance in public since that accident in her house in Mustique where she fell into a bath of scalding water. She's incapacitated by her serious stroke. Prince Harry and the anthem, The Spirit of the Lord by Sir Edward Elgar. These recorded images, the highlights of this service being shown to you now as uh, the couple and their parents are actually signing the register. Let's bring in Robert Lacey in the studio again. Robert, what are your reflections on the service you've heard today? Well, I was very moved by it. I think anybody who would have who, who watched it couldn't help but be moved. Um, I suppose in terms of what Prince Edward was saying to you before the service, um, I think he's won his spurs, hasn't he, as an impresario. I mean, we saw uh, the man at whose knee he has sat, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and he staged it beautifully, very dignity, the sense of history, um, a large scale, but also I felt particularly during one of the readings, it, it was small scale, like almost any parish church. I, I think it succeeded magnificently. And the pictures, as John Suchet was mentioning, they were much closer, uh, much more intimate than I think we've seen before, certainly in an occasion like this. Oh yes, um, interestingly, the, the marriage of the, of the Queen Mother um, back in the 1920s, there were only obviously then still photographers, and they were all kept at the very back of the church. I think it was with Prince Andrew for the first time that one actually saw the face of both um, the bride and groom. No, that can't be right, because we saw it with Charles and Diana, didn't we? Um, but uh, no, I thought these were particularly beautiful shots and of course uh, uh, I thought the bride looked um, absolutely stunning in her dress and the veil. Amanda Wakely, was there a moment there when that ring seemed not to be able to go on? That was a what... worrying moment, wasn't it? <laughs> but it eventually did. Yes. And we're now looking at the choir. 
But this was in many ways very different from what we've seen before in Royal Weddings, Robert. That's, that's quite indisputable. Yes, yes it was. Um, uh, to go back into the dress, I know this is Amanda's area. Um, uh, I think that's the sort of thing one's going to see in, uh, in, in museums in, in, in the future. Um, it's a wonderful collection of wedding dresses at Kensington Palace. Interestingly, you can actually see the little loops on the train where the, 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 the bridesmaids would, would hold it. And, uh, well, what do you think of that? I think it, it qualifies for a museum, don't you? I, absolutely. I thought it was wonderful. I thought the, the, the incredible richness in the beadwork. Um, it was far um, more fluid than I had expected. I, I had expected a, a, probably a grander dress, but perhaps that reflects the informality that both the bride and groom wanted in this wedding. Did all this business about no hats, Amanda Wakely, did it, did it provide a, a special challenge for some of the people attending this wedding for the, for, for the general choreography of it all? I think the whole concept of, of in inverted commas, a black tie wedding where women are really in evening dresses rather than wedding suits and hats um, provided quite a challenge because they, had to, they have to keep their shoulders covered, no hats. Um, so it's what do you do? Do you wear a strapless dress with a jacket over or, or do you wear a long sleeve dress? They, seems to have, they seem to have handled it rather well anyway. Very Let's go back now to John Suchet. Well, a reminder that uh, while the register is being signed out of our sight, uh, the choir is singing an anthem by Elgar. Uh, that signing of the register, the only part of today's proceedings that is away from the cameras. So just listen to the music and enjoy it. And we hear now the Amen Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Signing over, they're returning to the chapel, and in a moment a fanfare will sound, followed by the first verse only of the national anthem.
from Handel to the fanfare. are going to pay homage to the Queen. Well, Hugo Vickers, I suppose she's a queen before she's a mother and mother-in-law. Well, she's a mixture of the two, of course, but uh, all the members of the royal family do always bow and curtsy to the Queen, uh, particularly in public. And to the familiar wedding strains of Vidor's Toccata from his Fifth Symphony, the newly married couple process down the aisle the Earl and Countess of Wessex we must get used to that and the bridesmaids and pages trying very hard to stay far enough back from that tremendous veil and through the organ screen to see the less royal guests their personal friends How nice to see them smiling now that it all went without a hitch. As I said earlier at the rehearsal yesterday, it was constant smiling and joking. And back comes that sense of humor. It went faultlessly. Months of planning with Prince Edward, as we said earlier, taking an interest in every single detail, even to choosing the chairs at the top that uh, his parents and the bride's parents sat on. We never got to tell you the whole story of those chairs. Suffice it to say that Prince Edward chose them. The necklace and earrings that Sophie is wearing were a gift from her then fiancé, now her husband, and they emerge at the top of the steps to be greeted by the crowd. They'll be joined by both sets of parents for the official photographs, which will be taken by photographers from the top of the Muse houses directly opposite. Splendid sight. And if we can still hear the music, it will soon become Sir William Walton's crown imperial as the bells of the chapel peal out. In front of them, 200 people connected with the chapel who live in the cloister. But now, wonderful shot of Sophie. She and Edward waiting for their parents to emerge. Still no sunshine and quite a crisp wind. On the left, extreme left, Felix Sauerbutz, next to him, Harry Warburton. And on the right, the two bridesmaids. And cheers from those 200 people as the Queen descends the steps with Christopher Rhys-Jones and the Duke of Edinburgh with Mary Rhys-Jones.
Prince Edward still organizing things, making sure everyone's in the right place. She will be feeling the chill because it really has qu turned quite chilly here on the on a late Saturday afternoon in Windsor. No top hats. We were told there might be top hats for the gentlemen today. None of those. Very few hats for the ladies. And uh, drawing up in front of them at the bottom of the steps, a Landau from the Royal Mews in which they will take a tour of the town of Windsor. There will be two Landaus, one carrying the bride and groom and the second carrying the bride's attendants, as the first one we'll be concentrating on. Those Landaus are used by the Queen and her guests during Royal Ascot each June, so they've already been on display this week. A little bit of history in August 1711. Queen Anne was the first monarch to drive in procession from Windsor to Ascot to open the inaugural race meeting in a Landau just like this. Sam Shaw, the young designer, making sure that the dress she created is all right. All seems well. And off they go. And if you've ever wondered what postillions are, you're looking at two of them in their red tunics and top hats. <laughs> And uh, I know you want to know about those four horses in the centre of your picture drawing that Landau. I can tell you, they are Alderney, Twilight, Hillsborough and Auckland. <laughs> and I don't know which one is which. But they live here in the Royal Muse and Windsor. And the Landau is going to take the Royal Couple up through the castle precincts and out into the town for that uh, little tour of Windsor itself. passing the Queen Mother standing at the Galilee porch and uh, if we get another close-up look at Sophie you'll see she's wearing a, a tiara from the Queen's private collection given to her today to wear at this wedding we'll no doubt get a better view of it in a moment and there are the pages and the bridesmaids all of whom perform their functions perfectly Oh, and I can tell you that second carriage is uh, drawn by Cyprus, Windhoek, St. Patrick and King's Troop, four more horses who live here in the Royal Mews. Splendid sight, that. Unchanged for centuries. They may have broken with a few traditions here today, but uh, not all of them. And now I, uh, the Queen and Duguetta are in the very Rolls-Royce that uh, brought the bride. We can tell because of that perspex back that she so often uses. They will be being taken back into the castle proper to the royal apartments to prepare for the reception that is going to follow this, of which more later.
Well, Hugo Vickers, as we wait uh, for, well, even before that, the Queen Mother leaves now. There she goes. Back to the uh, Royal Apartments. Hugo Vickers, uh, you've attended many royal weddings. How did it go? Well, I think it uh, was a complete success, and I think it totally um, justified his choice of St. George's Chapel. I think the, the intimacy, the splendor of the banners of the Knights of the Garter, there's absolutely wonderful flowers, and all the details of which sometimes we only perhaps got a glimpse. I think they've all paid off. I think it was um, fantastic, and it will be a day that everyone who saw it or witnessed it will remember. And uh, that Landau is emerging through this gate to the top of the walk where our commentary positions are. And I'm looking out of my little window here. All heads are suddenly turning. Cameras are at the ready. The flashes have already begun to fire as they pass right by us. I'll let you uh, hear the cheers. And you can see in the uh, second land out, Prince Charles, Prince Andrew. That was unexpected. <laughs> so the three brothers on parade in Windsor as they go through the gates into the town itself. And now onto the public area of Castle Hill. Now for the, the confetti is flying as the people of Windsor, so used to royal events, see the new Earl and Countess of Wessex, Edward and Sophie, married, and they see them for the first time. And as they pull past that statue of Queen Victoria, let me tell you that Queen Victoria adored Windsor and spent her honeymoon here. And I'm here right in the thick of the crowds, and we're just catching the first glimpse of the land as it comes around the corner, down on just opposite the Guildhall on High Street here. And of course, this is what the crowds have been waiting for. We're seeing the bride and groom for the first time, and a much clearer view of Sophie than we had. Here she comes. Everyone giving them a wave. There she is, even for the cameras here. People have been hanging out of the windows here, waiting patiently throughout the ceremony. And I'm sorry if you can't hear me over the cheers, but we've been so expectant for this moment, waiting for the sight of them and, of course, Prince Charles there as well. People are really excited about that. It's been a long afternoon. Well, uh, only two years ago, a grand celebration was held in Windsor for the Queen's golden wedding anniversary. And it was actually the same day that uh, restoration after that dreadful fire was completed, the fire of 1992 that destroyed so much of the public uh, area, well, not public, but the area, the state area, I suppose, of Windsor Castle used for state banquets. All perfectly restored, that restoration completed just two years ago in time for the golden wedding anniversary here so as I said the people of this town are not unfamiliar with royal events but a wedding is always very special and they're in the high street now Windsor High Street <laughs> And uh, at the bottom of this street is uh, 
the shop Lavender Green, the florist who supplied all those flowers uh, in the chapel. Lilies, white roses. I spoke to the owner yesterday. She uh, told me that all the plants came from Holland. <laughs> well, not very patriotic, but apparently the Dutch do flowers better than we do. And they included a new white lily, which uh, forms part of the bouquet that Sophie's holding now. That lily is called Crusader. There it is, if you can see it in the middle of those white roses. And in fact, the Queen attended the naming ceremony of that lily, of the royal preview of the Chelsea Flower Show. Now they've uh, passed along Park Street and turned into the Long Walk, and you can see the imposing view, or you could just a second ago, of the castle at the top of that hill. And in a moment, when they reach the top of that, we will lose sight of them for the day. They will be going in there to prepare for this evening's reception in St George's Hall, which was so dreadfully damaged in the fire of 1992, but has now been restored boasts the finest hammer beam oak roof in the country and that reception we saw a little piece earlier in our program about the uh, caterers it'll begin with champagne i'll make your mouth water now it'll begin with champagne and a selection of hot and cold canapes prepared by a london-based company rhubarb food design whose press officer is a friend of sophie's couple chose 12 different varieties of canapes from a list of 2000 and 40 waiters will serve them up and uh, the wedding cake we are tipped off is rumored to be four feet high have four tiers and be decorated with daffodils reflecting Sophie's Welsh origins and it will also have on it tennis rackets recalling the couple's first meeting as we showed you earlier in the program at a real tennis court and that cake is said to have cost two thousand pounds well why not Wonderful shot of the two Landau's now and our final glimpses of the new royal couple, the Earl and Countess of Wessex, as we wave them off. And uh, one thing we don't know, totally appropriately, is where the honeymoon will be. Maybe they'll simply stay within the castle as we see them for the last time today. But as the airplanes go over, we are back in the studio here with Robert Lacey. Robert, um, what we saw, all that the royal couple went through today, is almost a kind of visual metaphor of the kind of life that they'll have to get accustomed to. How will they, how will they deal with that? How will they deal with that glare of the media? Well, I think they'll deal with it very well. They are both hardened uh, professionals. They have been called, perhaps a little unkindly, the yuppies of the royal family. I mean, uh, although the royal family, um, understandably, get very annoyed by the media, this couple have both chosen to make their careers in the media. Um, Prince Edward in the television film production area and of course Sophie Rhys-Jones by actually manipulating the media. Um, and I think um, we, well I think to answer your question, they're going to handle it very well indeed. I think what we saw today, they accomplished exactly what they wanted. Um, the ride through the streets of Windsor had that touch of pomp and ceremony but also the feeling of the country town. It was like a country wedding as we saw them go up um, the drive at the end and of course as ever the royal muse and the whole apparatus of of the royal performance machine um, just um, uh, did marvelously well. Amanda Wakely you know Sophie Rees Jones very well you're, you're, you're a close friend um, uh, how will she how will she react to this we saw in an early instance when she was rather annoyed about those pictures which were published which she obviously didn't want published but how, how will she deal with the rest of it do you agree Robert oh I think she'll deal beautifully with it you know she she's a true professional she knows how to work with the press um, but and people like her most importantly I think you know the press like her They're, they don't want to um, be unkind to her of course Robert, the point we kept making is this is, is, is not a royal wedding like others. And, um, and certainly in the crowds, we haven't really seen that sort of massive inflow of people, have we? No, no, when we got here this morning, it wasn't like um, uh, Charles and Diana's wedding when people had been camping in the streets and were, 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 were drinking the champagne already at, at, at breakfast time. No, no, it has been much more low-key. One of the things I was interested in, of course, is uh, the issue that's been much discussed, the way in which... Um, uh, Sophie said that she would obey. Um, I have my own take on that, which is that uh, it's been much discussed in terms of her and her husband, and she came up with a rather good rationale, saying, 
I really trust him. Um, I think actually in the context of a royal wedding, it was her signing on and saying, yes, I'll play by the rules. Maybe pre predecessors whom we won't mention said they wouldn't obey, but um, I'm one of the team now. And even though she says she's going to pursue her business, um, you know, sh she's on board in this family business. Robert Lacey, for the moment, thank you very much. Nicholas Owen has been on the castle walls watching the reaction of all the guests. Nick, uh, are they very happy with what they've seen today? Oh, indeed, I think they are. It has been a bit chilly, it has to be said. Not, for, not the sort of sunny afternoon we were all hoping for, but nevertheless, you can see below me now the crowd's beginning to stream away. An awful lot of people, uh, the, the main guests, main wedding guests, they departed in their coaches and some of them walking away, but now the those members of the public who you remember got tickets to get in here most of them from this area 8,000 in all within the castle precincts and they had a grandstand view of everything and they were also able to take part in the service most of them because it was relayed to them outside no rules here about hats or anything else and people came some of them a lot of them had cameras of course a lot of them had movie cameras quite a lot of them were eating there's a gold good old uh, good old-fashioned picnic going on in many places and there were some lovely touches, all, all sorts of little things I noticed. Policemen helping people who, who couldn't quite see, disabled people sitting at the back. Police came along and gathered them up. That, it, was, it was a day for that sort of thing. A very, very happy wedding atmosphere altogether, I have to say, Trevor. Nick, I must tell you that uh, people who were close by the studio here had some problem with the sound system. I'm not too sure that they were able to take part in the service, but from where you were, we could see that uh, we could hear that they, were, that they were enjoying it much more, because I think that their public sound systems actually work. Yes, the, 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 chapel, the chapel you see behind me, the sound system there worked very well indeed. All the hymns, all the service, and there was a wonder, couple of wonderful moments when people cheered, when they, when they heard the words, I declare you man and wife, there was a terrific cheer. And another moment was that singing of just the first verse of the national anthem. They sang and sang away, and when they came to the end of the anthem itself, a great cheer went straight up. So, Nick, there would have been great satisfaction, would there not, to, uh, by, by, on those people who were actually inside those, uh, the castle walls and able to really take part in, in, in what was a, a memorable service? Yes, I, I think they really did feel that. It was absolutely super. There was no feeling of being excluded. The, the other thing is they, they had a pretty clear idea, a lot of people, what was going on. I think one or two of them had those little television sets you can get now. Uh, and so they were able to follow the service in, in great detail. And, and frankly, from where I was, the service seemed to go past extremely quickly. And, and that, was, that was absolutely marvellous. And, and I, I have to pay tribute to people down there. A lot of them in shirt sleeves and so on. And as we keep saying, not a, not a very bright day at all. But the, but the feeling generally was that this was a wonderful day. We, we, we filled in the sunshine. We didn't have it, so we sort of created it here amongst ourselves. We were all having a most wonderful time, I have to tell you. And, uh, as, as Sophie and Edward set off, we're all waving away from up here as well, and it, just just terrific. We don't, you know, we mustn't go over the top about any of these sort of things, must we? And after all the, the record that they've been of royal weddings, uh, you might have thought there was a bit of scepticism and cynicism, but in the end, it was a family occasion primarily. And now we can go to Katie Derham again with members of the public outside the castle. Katie, I wonder what they made of uh, of the service. Well, as you can see, the crowds here are beginning to move away. I'm absolutely surrounded, but we are in the thick of it still, here on High Street, very near the Guildhall, where there was another wedding earlier this afternoon as well. But, of course, we just had the great excitement of seeing the Landau go past so close to us after the long wait and seeing both Edward and Sophie smiling and waving in our direction, which we were very pleased about indeed. And I've got all these, my new friends, who I've been standing with for the last half an hour during the ceremony and before. And, uh, really, it's a question now of what they all thought. So... You were here all afternoon. Oh, so about three hours, but it's really exciting. It's really worth it. It's exciting to see the last of the Queen's children getting married, and we really hope this marriage will work. It's really good. There's been lots of talk, hasn't there, about how this has been a modern wedding, something a bit different from the pomp of the other ones. I mean, do you, did you think we missed out on anything? Well, I think we missed out perhaps a little bit on all the... I'd like to see a few guards and horses and bands and things, but it's nice. It's what they, they chose. It's what they wanted. And after all, we choose what we want for our weddings, don't we? So... I hope they'll be really happy. Indeed. Now, what did you think of what you saw? Was it what you expected? Yeah, she was lovely. She was very pretty, very natural. It was, it was lovely, actually. It was really nice. It was, it, we had a very good view, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> There's some benefits to Absolutely. being with a cameraman. Yeah, no, it was lovely. It was really nice. It was, yeah, it was good. I'm glad I came. 
They certainly look very happy. Now, your little one was very well behaved, didn't cry at all. Very good boy. <laughs> the youngest member. That's probably. right, yeah. <laughs> won't, live to, uh, won't be old enough to tell the tale, but <laughs> he was there. <laughs> now, why did you come along? What was it so important about coming along to Windsor today? I just wanted to see Sophie yeah. and Edward to get married. And were you pleased with what you saw? Yeah, very. What was your favourite bit? When she come on with the horse and cart. What do you do think? I, I think you're probably together. What do you think about um, the, the way they arranged this wedding? Did you think it was too late in the afternoon, maybe a bit too relaxed? No. I think it's just typical Sophie, really. <laughs> do you think she's very much her own woman and uh, this was her way of showing this is the kind of wedding she wanted? Definitely. <laughs> so what now? I came from Montreal, Canada to see the wedding from 3,000 miles and arrived just the day before yesterday, so it was absolutely wonderful. I'm thrilled. You see? So many people here are so pleased they've taken the time to wait to see all this spectacle. The view of people in the crowds down in Windsor. Now, no way, of course, the events of this afternoon have been followed more closely than in the village of Brinchley in Kent. That's where Sophie Rees-Jones grew up and where her parents still live. Shirley Ghosh has spent the day there and she reports now on how Sophie's big day was celebrated in her home village. <laughs> It was an atmosphere of pride and excitement in Brenchley today, as local girl Sophie Rees Jones finally married her prince. This normally quiet village in the heart of Kent laid on a street party for nearly 200 children and their families. Complete with flags, band and plenty of food, the celebrations took place outside the village pub, where a young Sophie would meet her friends. There was even a cake with a mini bride and groom, and the message from Brenchley to Sophie and Edward was simple. I wish um, all the luck in the world and Sophie and Prince Edward. I hope Sophie and Edward think that we're giving them the go ahead, really, <laughs> and that they should have a wonderful life together. Well, it's a fairy story, isn't it? Um, everyone who's got a daughter dreams that their uh, daughter might at one day marry a prince. Um, so it's, it's what fairy stories are made of, and it's, it's, it's just come true for this village. As the marriage ceremony took place, many people stayed glued to their television screens. After all, it's not every day a local girl becomes royalty. She just looks lovely and she looks normal and they're not dolled up for the occasion. And what did you think about Edward? What do you think he's thinking right now? I reckon he's very scared. <laughs> <laughs> but the locals say now they're married, it's time they had their privacy. I think I'd like to see them left alone to, to adapt and adjust to married life. And I think sometimes there's a bit of you know, media interest in them, from us as well as from the newspapers and television. And I think it's just nice to leave them to enjoy their married life. Brenchley is possibly the proudest village on earth today. These celebrations are something no one will forget for a long, long time. And Shuli Ghosh can join us now from that proud village of Benchley. Shuli? Well, it's been a glorious afternoon here, Trevor. You can hear the church bells pealing out in honour of Sophie and Edward's marriage. Now, over here behind me, you can see the house where Sophie and her family moved when they came to Brenchley some 30 years ago. The street party is uh, officially over, but still going strong. Nobody shows any signs of leaving, and really, why should they? Everyone's having such a great time. Now, uh, among those who uh, watched the ceremony, of course, I have with me Reverend Trevor Vickery and his wife, Alice, both former teachers of Sophie. Reverend, if I can come to you first, you watched the wedding ceremony. It seemed to go without a hitch. What did you make of it? It was lovely. I love that form of service. 1928 form of marriage, and I must have taken that hundreds of times myself. I'd taken part in the service. That's a form which I would have been using. Very upbeat kind of ceremony. Is that sort of fitting with your memories of Sophie? Yes. It had to be a very happy service because she loved happiness and everything had to be joy and joyful and happy for her as well. Alice, if I can come to you, what did you think of the ceremony and what did oh, you think of the dress? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. It, it was so simple um, and elegant like Sophie. Now, both of you would have a long and happy marriage. Any tips for the married couples? <laughs> yes, carry on with happiness and joy and happiness. And I'm glad that she promised to obey, because my wife promised to obey. Lovely. I, I'm not sure. 
Well, listen, sir, thank you both of you for joining me. And, of course, the whole village here in Brenchley has been watching the ceremony. If I can ask their opinions, what did you think of the dress? It was lovely. I thought she looked radiant. Very medieval dress, I thought. Very nice. And was it very exciting to see a local girl sort of come into the limelight like this? It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It was a stunning thing to see. What did you think while you were watching the ceremony? I thought she was very poignant and her words were absolutely wonderful. Came across, she looked at him and he looked at her and it was just bliss. I thought they looked a little bit nervous at one point. What did you think? I think she was a little bit nervous, but then any bride would be on their wedding day, but I think she carried it off very well, and she looked absolutely stunning. Ladies, what did you think? I thought she looked wonderful, and I love the idea of the sweet peas up in the church, a real sort of country feel to the whole thing, as she is a country girl from Kent. Was there a lot of interest in your household over watching the wedding ceremony? Well, yes, there was. My parents are actually going to the wedding, so we were all really excited to actually, you know, the thought of seeing them there. And I actually did see them on the telly, so it was very exciting. Were you actually sort of waiting quite anxiously to see what the dress would be like? Because there's been a lot of speculation, hasn't there? And there has, and I, I think it was better than all, all the rumours. I mean, it was so elegant, and I think much more elegant than some of the previous royal wedding dresses. And I think, I think the fact that it was so simple as well, it, it just looked amazing. And finally, very quickly, uh, any advice for the Murray couple? I just hope they, they do well and they try to ignore the adverse effects that the media might have and I wish them lots of happiness. Well, I'm sure the media will join you and, and everybody in Brenchley in wishing Sophie and Edward a very long and very happy marriage. Julie Gosh in Brenchley, thank you very much. I think we have time now to take another look at those images which will certainly be on the front pages of every national newspaper tomorrow. Sophie Rees-Jones and her husband, Prince Edward. And now, of course, um, Robert Lacey here in the studio. They're, 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 she's the Countess of Wessex. Countess of Wessex. I, mean, I think, as we noticed from uh, what everybody was saying, she's still Sophie to most of the world. Indeed. Whether people will think of her in that way, I don't know. And I suppose, although I felt this was a little truncated uh, today, the, the, the pictures, and I didn't see many people taking pictures, it was, in, in, in essence, the, 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 the balcony scene. That yes. we are accustomed to. Yes, I mean, the, the royal weddings we've had um, in London have um, seen everybody processing through the streets and then they vanish into Buckingham Palace um, and uh, eventually emerge um, on the balcony. And the plan, I think, here was, although, of course, the private family pictures are going to be taken back in the castle, to have a photo call here on the steps. Um, if I have to make one small criticism, I'm, I'm sorry they didn't kiss. This was the moment for them to kiss, and they didn't. But... Um, uh, it was their style of wedding. Amanda, this was another departure, wasn't it? No, no, no kiss. We saw, we saw no kiss after the, the vows in the church, and none on the on the balcony scene, as it were, on the steps afterwards. Which, which I think is rather sad because I think they're very much in love, and I think the nation wants to get behind um, this sort of. But next you, royal you wedding. know, you know, Sophie. Why, why would it have been decided that that wasn't part of the agenda here today? I, I don't know. I really don't know. It surprised me. Robert, did you have any views on it at all? Well, I think here we are. We're looking at the land out coming in. I think it sort of took me a bit by surprise. I mean, you know, we were, 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 were privileged to know what was planned in advance. And I think this stage of things was, in fact, meant to go on rather longer than it did, in fact. And it just didn't. Robert Lacey, Amanda Wakeley, for the time being, thank you very much. Let's go back now to John Suchet. John? Well, as uh, we look at shots earlier, from earlier this afternoon, there's a view of the main entrance, the front door, as uh, I referred to it earlier, of Windsor Castle, if such an imposing structure can have a front door. Now, we spoke earlier about the reception that's going to take place behind those doors this evening. Hugo Vickers, it's going to take place, as I said, in St George's Hall, which uh, suffered dreadfully in that fire. Yes, St George's Hall really suffered worse than anything else, and um, because the fire spread incredibly quickly. But what has been so wonderful was the way in which it was restored. And I remember actually going to the press reception which, uh, where they launched the uh, details of the restoration. And they said that it had been completed on time, in fact a little bit earlier than they expected. And it had also been completed within the budget. And it was going to be ready, as you said earlier, for the celebrations for the Queen's Golden Wedding. And there was a sort of collective sigh of disappointment from the gentlemen of the press gathered there because they simply couldn't think what to say after that. They were terribly disappointed. <laughs> well, I suppose that th this part of the wedding is traditional because that is the, the most formal setting out here at Windsor, isn't it? It is where state functions happen. 
Uh, yes, St George's Hall is um, a wonderfully long room and it is used for banquets. Uh, it will be used for the big banquet for the President of Hungary when he arrives on Tuesday night. Uh, you may remember we have seen in the past a uh, film of banquets of when President Reagan came and President um, Václav Havel for, um, came over. Uh, that's where it's, where it's been filmed, in St George's Hall. A magnificent room. I actually did have the great excitement once of walking around the roof of it during part of the restoration and it was absolutely fascinating to see the incredibly meticulous work that was being done um, by the restorers. They all look very, very happily employed. Well, uh, the event itself will be less than formal even though the setting is pretty formal. I spoke earlier about uh, the food that would be served. I can also tell you that uh, there will be a selection of red and white wine from the Queen's private cellar. Uh, the Herald Trumpeters from the Royal Marines will herald the toasts, the formal toasts. Uh, those are the same trumpeters that we saw inside St George's Chapel, uh, to, who played the fanfare for Sophie. And finally, let me tell you about the music tonight at the reception. A string quartet from the National Youth Orchestra of Scotland will play, along with a brass ensemble of the London Mozart players. Let's hope they include some music by Beethoven. And still out on the castle walls is Nick Owen. Nick, your final thoughts on today? Well, Trevor, my main thought is that this wedding wanted to be a blend. They wanted it to be a blend of a family occasion and a spectacle. And I think they succeeded, really, both for those of us lucky enough to be here and for the many watching at home. Uh, it was the groom who played his part greatly in making sure it was really a TV show of considerable uh, enjoyment. But you would expect that. After all, it's his uh, profession, it's how he makes his living. Well, not quite being a royal, perhaps. If there were any surprises, really, it came with this business of the titles, the Earl and Countess of Wessex. A bit strange, really, in this egalitarian age, perhaps. I think, really, you know, the Queen's fourth child and his bride are very lucky people in many ways. They do seem made for each other, and public tastes have certainly changed since the disasters that have befallen other royals. So they should be left in relative peace. I mean, the sort of people you see here leaving, seeing, leaving the wedding now, they're not keen to see the media intruding, and the, key, the media, frankly, is not keen to intrude either. Edward and Sophie should be allowed to get on with their business careers in relative peace. And, and one reason for all that, frankly, is that there is a new star on the horizon. The royal family has Prince William. He'll be 17 on Monday, and the media spotlight is increasingly, I have to say, falling on him. But for Edward and Sophie, this was a grand day in every way. I, I shared the surprise a bit about the, the lack of a kiss. I suppose, again, thinking back, they'll say to themselves, there was that kiss on the balcony at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Diana, and look how that ended. Prince Andrew, I have to say, and uh, the Duchess of York, they, they did a lot of kissing in public and they still do from time to time, but that didn't end very well. All those lessons, all those images they know, the bad images they don't want to repeat, so perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised that they didn't do that. But when the Landau was going around the streets of Windsor, th there was an opportunity for the common touch, if you like, to, to, to let people see the newest member of the royal family, and everybody played their part in that. It was, it was absolutely wonderful to see. Uh, I, I couldn't help feeling a bit, as Edward and and Sophie Rees-Jones went round, that they kind of glad this little bit was over. Now there's that reception to come. Very nerve-wracking affair that's going to be. I feel particularly for Sophie Rees-Jones's father. He is going to have to be uh, making a speech in front of the whole royal family. Very daunting indeed. I'm sure he will do it very well. Everyone's played their part very well. Nick Owen, thank you. And that brings us to a close of this special programme on the marriage of Prince Edward to Sophie Rhys-Jones. You heard their new titles. It was a day which saw the eyes of the world fix here on Windsor as the royal family welcomed a new member. And it was a day when many traditions were set aside to make way for a new style of royal wedding. But mostly it was a day which saw a young couple celebrate their love for each other. We leave you now with some of today's most memorable images from me and from all my colleagues here at Windsor. Goodbye.
I pronounce that they be man and wife together. to look and feel better. Even a bloke like me can do a lot of things towards a healthier life. Now you can. Phil Middlemas presents the Guide to Healthy Living. Expert practical advice on everything from exercise and diet to the very latest...